it gives me great pleasure to introduce one of the most important people in my life. I met Larry Silverstein for the first time in May 2009. And I'd like to say it was the luckiest month of my life. Larry was looking for someone to join Silverstein Properties with an eye towards taking the reins at some point in the future. I was looking to work with an organization that had a great culture, a sense of togetherness, and was dedicated to the community. May 2009 was also the month I met my wife, Allison. In a couple of months, we'll be celebrating our 10-year wedding anniversary. And also, next month marks my 13-year anniversary at Silverstein Properties. And it goes without saying that Larry and I have a great chemistry. We're both deal junkies, we love the business that we're in, and we both plan to do this forever. Now, Larry's only 91, so I clearly have a little catching up to do. But all kidding aside, Larry's been a true partner, a true mentor, and a true friend, and he's someone I deeply, deeply admire. So ladies and gentlemen, please give, me, give a warm welcome to Larry Silverstein. Speaking after a person like Mayor Adams presents some real challenges. <laughs> it makes me feel like Elizabeth Taylor's eighth husband on the honeymoon night. <laughs> I know what I gotta do, but how do I make it interesting? <laughs> so, I've got a uh, I've got a pretty heavy speech here. This mayor is determined with everything within him. to make this city the best it could possibly be. He's giving it his all. He's working his tail off to accomplish it. He brings his verve, his determination, his dedication, his commitments. He wants to, he wants to do it. To have the courage that he's displaying after so many prior administrations failed to accomplish getting the mentally ill off the streets of New York so that we could all feel comfortable in walking, riding the subways, the buses, being around the city. It takes tremendous guts. He's got the guts. He really wants to accomplish it because he knows how deeply we all feel about the importance of safety in our lives. This mayor is a centrist. He's not too far to the right. He's not too far to the left. He's where we need him to be. 
But you know, he's got, among other things, a city council that are progressives. They're all the way in that direction, not in this direction, not in the middle. Does that help him? Does that hinder him? Let me tell you, it hinders the hell out of him. It makes it infinitely more difficult because we need centrism in our thinking. We need to come together from out here, from out here, come together to be able to accomplish what needs to be accomplished for this city. I'm sure you've heard that we have some very significant budgetary problems ahead of us. What's multiple billions of dollars of deficit is what we're facing in this city. And unfortunately, multiple billions of dollars that we're facing in Albany as well. So the determination to reduce the COVID benefits we've had is affecting the city budgetarily in a very major way. So what do you do for the city? What do you do for the, for the primary source of revenue? What is that primary source? What do you think? Where's it coming from? Where else? Real estate taxes. The real estate industry in the city of New York pays $35 billion to support the city's needs. Take all other tax revenues in this town, it only comes to $30 billion. So the primary source, the largest single source of revenues for the city of New York, real estate taxes. So often this city and its leadership has been lambasted for their efforts on behalf of the city. Now most of you weren't around in the 1970s. Most of you weren't born in the 1970s. But I remember when the Beam administration was on the verge of declaring bankruptcy for the city of New York. It didn't have enough money to cover the payrolls. It didn't have, it couldn't meet its obligations to the police department, the fire department, the teachers, the municipal workers. A guy by the name of Lou Rudin, Bill Rudin's dad, who I happen to know very well, he got on the phone, he called all the major real estate players in this town, and he said, you know what? This city is desperate for, for money. It needs us to prepay our taxes. So let's all get there. Let's all get behind this effort and send the money in to the city to prepay those taxes so as to give the city enough money to meet its Friday afternoon payroll obligations. We were there for the city then. We're there for the city now. Because without us, the city can't function but with us, the city functions much, much better. And so when you look at the picture, so often you see negative press following Mayor Rams. He really doesn't deserve that because what he does deserve is the support of all of us. And the only way I suspect that we're gonna get through this crisis of ours, because by golly, there are a whole range of problems 
all of which I'm sure you've heard of this morning. We've got to really pull together in this city if we're going to accomplish what we need to accomplish. It took the de Blasio administration. We tried, what, four or five years? The Queen's Project. When it came time to pushing it through, he wasn't there. I don't know where the hell he was, but he sure as hell wasn't paying attention. It took Mayor Adams, first term, he had the guts, he had the determination, he had the conviction to get it done. And the benefits to the city will be enormous. The number of housing units, over 3,000 housing units in Queens will make a huge difference because what it's going to do is replace poor, very, very poor industries, body shops and so forth, with dignified new housing. A huge component of it is affordable. The balance of it is market rate. But it was the mayor who determined this had to get done. And in his administration, he got it done. Was it easy? No. There were people who objected to it strenuously. Some people have the idea that every, every project has to have at least 50% affordable. There's a problem with that. You know what it is? You can't finance it. And if you can't finance it, Developers are not going to build it. And 50% affordable, you think, maybe in light of what you keep hearing, which is we want 100% affordable. Just not realistic. So what we're facing is the need to be in the middle of the road. We need people who are centrists. And this mayor, God bless him, is exactly that. He's determined and he wants to get us there. And with our help, we'll make it happen. You know, 9-11 changed our world. In many ways, many ways, we saw Americans at their very best right after 9-11, New Yorkers particularly, because thousands of them came right after 9-11 to see if they could find people, construction workers, whatever, people who were in the debris, if they could find, if they could rescue them, if they were still alive, and bring them out of that rubble. And so many of those people came from around New York, some of them to help find firemen who lost their lives down there policemen who lost their lives down there, workers who they didn't know, but they were there to help people in desperate need. Some of them gone, some of them perhaps still there, some of them perhaps could, that still could be rescued. But here's what people giving them themselves and taking exposure, such as no one ever dreamt people would do, and yet, they took themselves and put themselves under tremendous pressure and under difficult circumstances. The air was terrible to breathe, and yet they breathed it in an effort to save lives of people they didn't know.
but they came to do something that had to be done. It was New Yorkers and Americans at their best. But the truth of the matter is, it was the result of people coming together to make things better, to make things work. We paid $3.2 billion to acquire the Twin Towers. We were told by 22 insurance companies, you'll never succeed. Don't bother, don't try. No one will ever come down to work here again. No one will ever want to live here again. And I looked at these guys and I said, you know something? We're gonna rebuild this place. Because if we don't, we'll give the terrorists exactly what they wanted. They want to prevail, they want to succeed. They want to make sure this land dies, lies fallow forever. I said, I'm a New Yorker. This ain't happening. As long as I'm here, I'm gonna make sure this place gets rebuilt. And I can't tell you how many negatives, how many naysayers were around there to tell us we couldn't succeed. It will never happen. Do something else for your life. And my attitude was, I'm a New Yorker. We're gonna get this rebuilt. And so notwithstanding all of the negatives, notwithstanding 22 insurance companies who said, forget it, get lost. We prevailed. We since spent $10 billion to rebuild seven, Tower 7, Tower, tower 4, Tower 3. The port spent another $10 billion. Together we spent about $20 billion rebuilding a $3.2 billion acquisition. How come? Of course, prices have gone crazy. <laughs> Costs are nuts. But the buildings are the most superior buildings ever built in this country. And the standards, the quality that we have down there is unlike anything else anywhere in the United States, maybe the world, I don't know. You keep reading about problems. You keep hearing negatives. Office buildings, terrible, gone, forget it. Never come back. People are gonna work from home forever. Bullshit, I mean, that's so ridiculous. <laughs> So, notwithstanding all this vacant office space, we're working our tails off to build another three million feet. It's called Tower Two, down the Trade Center. It'll be the only carbon neutral building in the United States. I'm sure it'll be followed by dozens of others. Does it make it more costly to have an all electric building? The answer is yes. Does it make it more costly to have photovoltaic cells produce some of the electricity? Yes. And for a guy who's 91 and a half, Look at a 50-year payback. <laughs> Doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense. But we're doing it. Because to achieve the most climatologically sensitive building in this country, that's what it's got to do, all electric building. So people tell us, Silverstein, you've got all of this vacant office space in New York. How in the hell are you gonna fill this? Well, we hope to get into the ground in the middle of 24. Building be finished sometime in 29.
And there are a whole mess of tenants out there who are in buildings that are now 65, 70, 75, 80 years old. Those buildings don't work anymore, especially for large companies that need modern facilities. And for people who want to work in healthy, healthy climatological conditions. Trying to retrofit some of those buildings, forget it. Not gonna happen. So, candidly, I believe we can fill the three million feet of space. So we're gonna put five billion into building to World Trade. We've entered into a joint venture with Brookfield. We're gonna build the only residential tower on the World Trade Center campus. It will have 1,300 rental housing units, 25% of which will be affordable. Cost, about a billion four. So if you put, if you take the 10 billion that we've spent, the 10 billion that the port has spent to date, add to that, add to that 20 billion, another 6.4 billion for Tower 2 and Tower 5. You're talking about roughly 26 plus billion dollars to rebuild a $3.2 billion acquisition. I say to myself, I look back, and I say to myself, how the hell did this happen? Where did all this money come from? Yeah, there's a lot of wealth in the world, but how did all this develop? My father, was a real estate broker. I remember trying to earn a living as a broker and I didn't do too well. Thank God I met my sweetheart. We've been all together for 66 years. She was a teacher in the public school system. We got along on her $3,200 a year salary. We had a Chevrolet, could afford her. $110 a month in a, an apartment, and life was good. Until we said, you know what, it's time for a family. Now I had to get to work and produce some income. I remember saying to my father, I said, Dad, being a broker here in the Woolen, the Garment the District, the Remnants District between House Street and Canal Street, Lafayette, over to 6th Avenue. I said, we're gonna starve to death down here. I said, the guys who make the money are the owners. My father looks at me and says, how do we become, we have no money. I said, Dad, look at today's times. Two guys, one by the name of Helmsley, Harry Helmsley, of the number by the name of Lawrence Ween. They bought the Empire State Building. How'd they do it? They got 5,000 investors to each buy a $5,000 limited partnership investment in the ownership of the Empire State Building. So I said, maybe this is a way we can Without our money, we had no money. So my father says, okay, find the building to buy. So I went out to try to find a building to buy. 20, I was, this is 1957. There was a building on East 23rd Street, 220 East 23rd Street, a real piece of junk. <laughs> it was cruddy, a lot of vacant space. It was old unattractive, but a woman by the name of Strack owned it and she was willing to sell it. 
So she said, I'll give you a contract, but you got to put down a $15,000 deposit. I came back, said to my dad, I said, Dad, we need $15,000. Where do you get $15,000? You go to a bank, borrow $15,000. So I went to a bank. First thing they said is, do you have any collateral? I said, if we had collateral, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> went to bank after bank after, I can't say how many banks you went to, just try to borrow $15,000. But if you don't have anything to borrow against, they're not going to lend you the 15000 Yet there was a bank on Delancey Street, 85 Delancey. I remember walking in there with my dad, met a fellow by the name of Green, Philip Green, managed the bank. And I said, we'd like to borrow 15000 He said, do you have any collateral? I said, <laughs> I said, no. He said, well, what's it for? And I said, we want to sign a contract to buy a building. He said, well, what are the details? And I took out some papers. I started giving him the details. At which point he takes out a piece of paper. And he said, you know, sign it. I said, what is it? He said, it's a promissory note. I looked at him. I said, you're going to give us the money? He said, isn't that what you want? <laughs> I said, yes, but I, and then I stopped myself because I was just so incredibly surprised. He was a bank that was ready to lend us $15,000 for nothing. Well, not quite. He said, you're going to assign the contract to the bank. That's your collateral. I said, okay. He said, how much is the price? 600000 I said, yes, 600000 he said, what are you going to do for the balance? I said, I don't have a clue. What would you recommend? <laughs> <laughs> he said, you've got to get yourself a mortgage. I said, can you give us the mortgage? He said, no, I'm a commercial bank. I've got to go to a savings bank for that. So he said, go to, a, go to a, a savings bank on 23rd Street where the building is. So we walked, started walking down 23rd Street found the Broadway Savings Bank, walked in there, got in there, Norman Ramsey, manager of that bank. Started talking to him and ends up, they gave us a $350,000 mortgage on a $600,000 acquisition. So all we needed was $250,000 of equity to take title to this building. So I said, Dad, we in Helmsley, they did it with 5,000 people. I said, do you know 10 people you can go to? Actually, it was 25 people who you can go to who would put in $10,000 each to become a limited partner in the ownership of 212-24 East 23rd Street. Turns out he went to everybody, he leased a loft to or a store, or rented a store to or whatever. By golly, 25 people, he found them. And they each invested $10,000. And there we were, we bought ourselves our first acquisition. And that was the happiest time of my life because I said, you know what? This should only be number one of many to come. As it turns out, We found a whitewasher, personal spray paints. We can't use them today, forget it. But then spray paint the ceilings, the walls, everything. Make the place look bright. Go to the Army Navy stores on Canal Street, buy surplus fluorescent fixtures. Give them to the superintendent, let them hang the fixtures to make the space look bright. Clean the windows that hadn't been cleaned in 30 years get a, a floor scraper to scrape the floors, get the crap off the floors, 80 years of, 90 years of crap on the floors. The most hard, the most beautiful hardwood floors I ever saw was under 80 or 90 years worth of garbage on the floors. Suddenly the space looked beautiful and we ended up renting the space for a hell of a lot more than we ever anticipated. We were able to pay the investors 1% a month, 12% a year. Fantastic, they were thrilled. They said, 
find another one. <laughs> Second one was a million five. The third one, 3.2 million. The fourth one, 4.7 million, and so forth. And suddenly, we got calls from all those banks that wouldn't lend us $15,000. And they said, from now on, whatever you need, call us, we'll give you the money. You don't have to go out to the investors. Wow, a sea change in our lives. And from that, having available capital to go out and purchase right, right then and there, changed everything. It wasn't long before there was an opportunity to buy a piece of land on the Garden State Parkway in New Jersey. Put up a sign, build a suit, 100,000 feet. Truth of the matter is, the site could hold 300,000 feet, but I didn't want to be too aggressive. I said, start slow, start easy, 100,000 feet. Got a call one day. He said, how much can you build there? I said, 100,000 feet. I said, but we can expand that if, if you have a need for more. He said, well, how much is the total? What can you build in total? 300,000 feet. It didn't take long before we signed a lease, a net lease, for 20 years with Bell Labs, took the entire building. We financed that building for a hell of a lot more than it cost me to build the building and acquire the land. That suddenly triggered an appreciation of what it means, what you can do when you want to develop. Acquisition of existing is one thing. Developing is yet another opportunity level. Totally different and vastly superior. So, We've heard that there are going to be all kinds of problems in the mortgage market next year, 2023, and maybe 2024. And maybe there will be. And we've heard that many landlords are not going to be able to hold on to those buildings. That's also probably the case. Am I suggesting that there may be opportunities out there next year and the year after? Am I crazy? No, I'm not crazy. It's one hell of a time to pull some resources together with other, other, your friends, your colleagues and acquire from some of these lending institutions at a significant discount buildings that are being foreclosed. Maybe they won't work as office space anymore, but what they can do and what they can work for is conversion to residential. Because as you walk down Wall Street, the southern side of Wall Street, from Broad to Water Street, guess what? There isn't an office building left on the south side of the street that hasn't been converted to residential. So there's opportunities all over. And all I could say to you is seize the opportunities because there's no end of promise. There's no end to what you can't accomplish as a result of working in this incredible city of New York because it gives you all the opportunities. Thank you for listening.